Chip and Dale is the movie equivalent of someone in the wrong telling you a story about how they were in the right. It's the physical embodiment of someone trapping themselves under so many layers of irony that any sincerity would kill them. Viewing it felt like I was watching an egotistical fat guy trying to give himself a blowjob for an hour and 30 minutes. I would have laughed if the site wasn't so pathetic. It's a corporation trying to pay homage to the olden days by just digging up its corpse and wailing it around like a puppet. This movie has the heart and sincerity of Mercedes during Pride Month. If Who Framed Roger Rabbit was a love letter to animation, then Chip and Dale was a letter bomb. Its comedy is like watching watching a comedian tell a bad joke and have them tell it over and over until you actually laugh just to end the pain. You know those parody movies that they do in The Boys where the writers make movies clearly making fun of the tropes of superhero movies? That's Chip and Dale minus the irony. How is it possible that I'm offended by an adaptation of characters from a show I'd never even seen? This movie fucking sucks dip. Hello everybody and welcome back. My name is Manga Writer and today I thought I would dive in headfirst into a trope that I have grown to despise. A trope that brews inside me a hatred that not even the hottest fires from the gulfs of hell could ever come close to replicating. A trope that I have seen raise its putrid looking head into mainstream media as of recent and is one that I have grown increasingly sick of. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about self-awareness. Now, in small doses, a story having self-awareness can actually be something that can be funny. A story calling itself out as a means to humble itself and not act like it's huffing its own farts can actually make a story into something quite special. And there's even been some characters in fiction whose whole thing is to be the writer's way of winking to their audience and sending off a message that they're in on the joke. This was fine. <laughs> The first hundred times they did it. Where I feel like self-awareness becomes extremely annoying is when a piece of media either starts to overuse it as a means to simply add in comedy where it doesn't really belong, or use it as a means to justify using a tired trope without getting any flack, because get it guys, their run on the joke doesn't make that writer so quirky and fun. In short, the overabundance of self-awareness is something I feel like is reaching an all-time high. You can't sit through any Marvel or Cinematic Universe movie without having a joke where the writers try to do their best to do a wink-wink nudge nudge to the audience nowadays, and no movie has that idea been proven more clearly than in the movie Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers. Ch -ch -chip and Dale, Rescue Rangers. Ch -ch -chip and Dale. I don't believe that I have ever seen a movie that actively tries so hard to not have any sincerity throughout its whole runtime. I've never seen a film that had so much potential to be an actual good movie get transformed into a putrid display of all the IPs Disney owns and just wants to shove in people's faces in hopes that the references would be enough to carry this film. It is possibly the most soulless cash grab of a movie that I had ever seen in my fucking life. And after about an hour and a half of sitting through it, I have come to the realization that I truly cannot trust anyone's review of this film and that Disney is a corporate parasite at its very core. So, let's just jump right in and talk about it. Here is my personal review of Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers, starting with the general plot. The basic plot of the movie is about Chip and Dale meeting each other as kids from school with a shared interest in making and performing comedy. After a few years of doing shows and climbing up the ladder, they one day make it big by getting a call to do their own show, which is of course, Rescue Rangers. The show goes on strong for two whole seasons, but Dale, having gotten an offer to do his own show, decides to drop the Chip and Dale project and go off on his own, causing his career, along with the other Rescue Rangers, to crumble, leading to them having to find other work. Fast forward a few years and there's been a rising case of cartoon characters going missing and because one of their friends gets kidnapped, Chip and Dale, now reunited by circumstance, go on a wide and epic quest to find their friend, where they come across many weird animation styles, a drug cartel, and a whole conspiracy that wishes to take on the mainstream media through the idea of bootlegs. Sounds like a fun adventure that could lead to a lot of potential laughs, right? Well, that's my first critique bootleg since he was somewhat of a star in the early 90s. <laughs> he was on the Rescue Rangers. We were on the show together. Chip and Dale, Rescue Rangers. When you need help, just call. Never heard of it. What? 
This movie's comedy is awful. Think of any bottom of the barrel joke you could possibly make with a concept like this and there is a chance that it is in this film. Everything from jokes lasting far too long to a point where the punchline is more of a relief rather than a nice surprise, the movie hitting you with lol random humor out of nowhere shattering the movie's pacing to a point where it's jarring, all the way down to the movie making a whole animation style just so that they can make basic as fuck jokes about it, this film does exactly what you would expect a corporate movie to do and it never goes above that. A prime example of how bad the comedy is in this movie is how the movie handled Ugly Sonic. You know, that one Sonic design everyone hated and now that it's in a movie people have started gaslighting themselves into thinking that they actually liked it and thought it was an amazing cameo. I truly hate Sonic fans with a passion, I really do. Take any wild guess about what kind of jokes they would make with him. You'd be correct, they do exactly that. What really should have been a cameo you would see in the background for a one-off joke instead has way too much screen time than what it really deserved. They really didn't try to do anything intelligent with him because what the fuck else could they have done? The joke is that he's ugly. There's nothing else to him. So rather than just making, I don't know, one joke about him, the writers decided to make him a reoccurring character in the movie, with every joke they make of him being just a repackaged version of the same tired punchline. Last time when the internet got one look at my human teeth and burned the place down. I told you I had a show there! No, 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 no. Ow, stupid teeth, I think I just bit my tongue! I've been offered a new reality show where I do ride-alongs with the FBI. It's called Ugly Sonic, Uglier Crimes. Oh, you want me to go fast? <laughs> That's Sonic's th Oh, baby! Oh, they're laughing at me. I know that. You can't hurt my feelings if I'm in on the joke. Uh, <laughs> I guess not. Get it? The joke is that he's ugly. Ugly Sonic was awful. Another example of the movie's very highbrow comedy is the whole Uncanny Valley animation style. Guess what kind of jokes they'll make with this and yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's all the jokes they make. Whoopee. I would say that this movie is like a stupid YouTube parody, but that would imply that this movie was more than just seeing how much they could get away with, which it wasn't. Another form of comedy this movie tries to do is try and subvert the audience by doing an old cliche and then almost immediately clowning on it. They do this one joke where the villain has a scene where they might have a change of heart or can actually be sympathetic, not once, but twice. Expecting that doing the same trick again was going to give the same result. Do you not know how comedy works? But because of all the previous jokes this movie gave its audience, this subversion, rather than being something I didn't see coming, was ironically the punchline I was expecting and honestly waiting for. The quicker you get to the punchline, the faster this movie goes. And yes, they even do this kind of humor during scenes where the comedy was not needed. I swear, what is it with kids' movies nowadays and trying to shove in a joke every 15 seconds? You're not gonna lose anyone! Jesus Christ, have a fucking soul! But where I think the comedy is at its absolute worst, is when the movie becomes self-aware. See, here's the thing. With the movie having a premise, such as the one I just gave you, this sounds like a concept that would, for the most part, be a very interesting way for the writers to commentate on the various bad things Disney tends to do while also being able to make fun of them in the process. This movie's whole world would have been, in a weird twist of events, the perfect chance for the writers to crank up the self-awareness to 11 and actually create a genuinely funny movie. This film honestly could have made for a very good parody if it was in the right hands. But because Disney has the ego of a communist in a country that doesn't practice communism, any form of self-reflection and critique towards their company would be seen as being too sincere. So instead, Rescue Rangers tries to take the middle road by calling out Disney without actually doing anything to change what they're calling out. For example, there is this one joke at the start of the movie where Chip overhears Alvin and the Chipmunks performing a rap song on television. And disgusted, Chip makes this comment. Uh, of course they're rapping. They always have to make the cartoons rap. Now with this kind of setup, you'd think that the movie would not do the rap trope, because that would make the movie look extremely hypocritical and ruin a possible commentary about how cringy rap is in kids' movies and actually put their foot down. But instead of going down that preferred route, Rescue Rangers decides to bring back this trope as a main plot point by having a fanboy character make them rap, otherwise they get caught. Now, this and combined with the remix of the Chip and Dale theme is already bad enough, but what makes this scene even worse is that Chip and Dale are so bad at rapping that the character who made them do it even comments on how bad they were. Whew, they were very bad at rapping. What? 
the fuck. A trope that could have easily been skipped over comes back in a joke that goes on for way too long, with the punchline being that Chip and Dale are bad at rapping. Movie, why are you so full of shit? Another joke in the same vein is where Chip goes off about how corporations will suck every penny out of a franchise while walking down the street. Talking about a reboot? Think they can squeeze a dollar out of essentially nothing? Garbage. Total garbage. Again, this actually could have been funny. Do you think that this is the writers saying that Disney are greedy bastards and will make a movie out of anything and therefore not do anything like that in this movie? The next time we see Chip is him watching a movie about Batman fighting E.T. and his crime because the movie was so good. I can't make this up if I tried, they really went there. Okay, yeah that one looks pretty good. There's even a last punch to the gut where the movie has Chip and Dale talk about how cringy a cover of their theme song would be at the end, and yeah, what do you think? Of course they fucking did it. Hollywood. I don't know if you... if you know this, but when you make a self-aware joke about a certain trope as a way to subvert your audience and do something better, you don't then go and do the trope you're criticizing! The best way that I can describe the comedy in Rescue Rangers is that it feels like a movie that's parodying a genre it hates rather than loves. It goes for the easiest jokes that one could make when mocking a trope or formula and thinks that just because they called out a stupid practice that inherently makes the movie's comedy better when it doesn't. It just makes the movie feel needlessly cynical and even pretentious. And when it goes ahead and does the trope anyway and does it under the notion that it knows it's bad and that's why it's funny, it just makes those self-aware scenes extremely painful to watch. You know it's bad. Why are you doing it? The movie's comedy, in trying so hard to be quirky and random, ended up turning out as being, in an ironic twist of events, extremely predictable. I'm not shitting you when I say I only laughed at one joke. Do you have any stinky cheese? You cops. Yeah, that was it. Let's now talk about the characters in the movie. Rescue Rangers follows the trope in other crime-related stories by having it so that the actual cast you hang around with for most of the film is actually pretty small. And you'd think that because of its smaller cast size, the movie would have actually had a lot of time to develop the Rescue Rangers themselves and make them into very likable protagonists, right? Well, there is actually a solid reason that when early reviews of this film came out, it only focused on the film's references and comedy and didn't say anything about how the film handled the Rescue Rangers themselves. You know, the titular characters. It's because there was nothing to them. The Rescue Rangers, as it turns out, are the most boring and bland part of their own movie. Watching Chip and Dale bicker and argue with each other all throughout the film was something that could have made for some light-hearted comedy, but because of how poorly developed these two were, their bickering ended up being repetitive, dragged out, and above all, extremely forced. On the one hand, you have Chip, who after switching career paths due to Rescue Rangers getting cancelled, now walks down the path of extreme nihilism and negativity. He serves as being the anchor of the two, and yeah, he really is the anchor. An anchor that sucks the life and soul out of every scene he's in. I shit you not when I say that almost all of this fucker's dialogue is either slight iterations of I don't wanna be in this movie and let's get this over with. Sorry, that was a fucking horrible John Mulaney impression. Or him being the writer's mouthpiece to call out bad writing while also participating in said bad writing. All of this in combining the fact that John Mulaney's voice has this constant drawly, no shits given attitude even in situations where he should be fucking emoting makes Chip into a cynical, spiteful, and draining character to watch. He has this whole thing where after Dale left, he has this hatred of making friends, and where I can somewhat understand where the film's trying to go with this, it doesn't really deliver on that. Given that Chip is shown to have a lot of people who like his company and even greet him as he walks down the street. Hell, his co-workers even offered him a chance to hang out with them. You'd think if they wanted to make Chip look very antisocial, they wouldn't make him good with people. I guess this might have been the movie's subtle way of showing that Chip might have grown some kind of antisocial behavior, and I guess that could have worked to some extent. But as I was watching the movie, I saw his constant eye-rolling, rejecting of other people, and bored expressions as being more of him just being spiteful than anything else. And then comes his interactions with Dale which is basically just bullying. I do understand that Chip is still angry at Dale for how he single-handedly killed the show for him and all of their friends, but after the 15th time of hearing Chip making a snide comment towards Dale, I ended up really not giving a shit about Chip's conflict and found him 
honestly really annoying. There's only so much sass and backhandedness I can take from a character before I just wish the movie called them out on their annoying behavior. And Chip finds a way to cross that line far more times than he should have. But as I say all of this, I do ironically find myself siding with Chip more times than I should have solely based on the fact that Dale is fucking worse. Dale, of course, serves as being the dunce of the two, you know, like in the original cartoons and shorts that he was in, always getting the two in trouble and finding ways to make light out of a bad situation. He's meant to serve as the yang to Chip's yin, and because Chip's nihilism was very annoying on one extreme, Dale has his own flavor of annoying by being an obnoxious ball of sunshine. If Chip was the writers trying to call out Disney on the shit that they do, then Dale is the stan that praises everything Disney does. He's filled to the brim with pop culture references, sucking off Disney's success, embracing old tropes, and usually being the one that gets the two in trouble. He's just a colossal idiot. I wouldn't mind Dale being this obnoxiously stupid if it wasn't for the fact that the movie never really punishes him for any bad thing he does. He doesn't get punished for being an obnoxious actor or being a colossal idiot who gets them caught, but rather gets rewarded for stupid behavior like this. He doesn't get punished for leaving the show and risking the chance of it being cancelled and going behind everyone's back so they couldn't have a say in anything. In fact, the movie tries to make you sympathize with him and tries to make Chip out as the bad guy for being mad and it's just like, fuck, what the hell, huh? Motherfucker, it's your fault! You're fucking lucky that your friends didn't care too much because in any movie they would have been justifiably very mad at you. And the whole part of him getting CGI surgery? He doesn't get punished for that either. There's no commentary on franchises doing soulless CGI reboots to stay relevant or anything along those lines because that actually would have been interesting. Dale is just CGI because... He can. Are you starting to see how much this movie could have actually had some good comedy and even commentary if the writers just decided to be a little bit more creative? But nah, Dale is just the goofball idiot who never gets any serious comeuppance or anything. He just gets to act like an idiot with little pushback, with Chip being the nihilistic asshole by his side. Truly a wonderful fucking duo. God, I fucking hate these characters. As for the other people in the cast? It would be very nice of me to even call them characters. Aside from Ellie being the most likable out of the side characters and being easily the most developed, everybody else in the movie just serves as either being a joke that the writers thought was funny or being an animation style that they wanted to show off. The way they animate is really the only things that makes these characters even remotely memorable. I'm not kidding when I say that. What's even more insulting is that the other rescue rangers, you know, like Gadget and stuff, they're barely in the fucking movie. And to see that Gadget got frisky with the show's fucking animal sidekick, and seeing Monty develop into being a drug addict after the cancellation of Chip and Dale, and it's just... Man, you really can't have a cast of lovable characters come back and not have something weird, can you? Is it really that hard to just pay respect to the source material? I haven't even seen this show and I am somehow offended. But where I think this movie really falls off the deep end to a point where I absolutely hate it, is the main villain of the movie. Sweet Peach. This shit is what made me truly hate this movie. Watching this guy be a villain was some of the most tasteless shit I've ever seen in my life. Now, to anybody that does not know why I find this movie's portrayal of Peter Pan to be so incredibly offensive and tasteless, I will provide you with some context that is very dark and very depressing. I would usually try and put a bit of a warning here, but this time I won't. I think it's best I tell you the story for what it is, and it's a story that you need to hear, just to see how heartless this movie truly is. Let me tell you what is possibly one of Disney's darkest stories, a story of a man named Bobby Driscoll. Bobby was a child actor born in 1937 and met great success at Disney in his lead role in the now controversial movie Song of the South. Because of this, he is known as being one of the first child stars to act under Disney through a contract. After playing many different roles in various movies, Bobby was chosen to play Peter Pan in the original animated Disney film during the years 1949 to mid-1951. This was back in the day when Disney would use the actor's face and body to accurately draw the characters in their movies, as that allowed the actor's performance to become one with their characters. And so, when you see Peter Pan up close on screen, you're looking at an animated version of Bobby's face. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of the two. The resemblance is scarily striking. And because of this, 
Bobby was not only the voice and model of Peter Pan, but he would actually perform as him in shows Disneyland would put on, capturing the hearts of thousands as he did so. When I say that Bobby was Peter Pan, I mean that Bobby Driscoll was Peter Pan. Bobby at this point in his life was at the height of his career. He was even known as being Walt Disney's favorite child star, with Mark Elliott being quoted in his biography as saying, Walt often referred to Driscoll with great affection as the living embodiment of his own youth. Things seemed to be really looking up for Bobby. However, Bobby's life as a child star would suddenly start going down a dark, dark path, which all began when he started going through puberty. Bobby's transition to puberty was the first and final blow to his career at Disney. Because of his now deeper voice and physical changes, Disney himself stated that he now saw Driscoll as best suited for roles as a young bully rather than a likable protagonist. And because of that, Bobby struggled to find work, as there were not many roles that fit his predicament to fill in at the time. Because of puberty and Bobby having a severe outbreak of acne at this point, his contract that said he still had a few years left with Disney was cancelled, with the reason given being that Bobby would have had to wear tons of makeup to try and cover up his acne. This all happened only weeks after Peter Pan was released in theaters. Bobby's career at Disney was over. And so, Bobby was left to find other work. Because of the stigma of being a child star from Disney, it was hard for Bobby to find any serious work. He eventually found some through doing radio shows and television, and even won a Milky Way Gold Star Award for his performances. But that was a quick light spark, compared to everything else. The Disney stigma didn't just apply to Hollywood. After moving from the Hollywood Professional School, where child actors were taught, like Bobby himself, to a public high school in Los Angeles, Bobby's life only got worse. Because of all his work he did at Disney, he was met with vicious amounts of bullying from his peers, even being quoted as saying, The other kids didn't accept me. They treated me as one apart. I tried desperately to be one of the gang. When they rejected me, I fought back, became belligerent and cocky, and was afraid all the time. And during his time of isolation and abuse inside this school, Bobby would then turn to the thing that would end up destroying his life. Drugs. I was 17 when I first experimented with the stuff. In no time, I was using whatever was available. Mostly heroin, because I had the money to pay for it. Bobby eventually went back to the Hollywood Professional School after asking his parents to do so, where he graduated in 1955, but his drug use only increased. His drug addiction got so bad that in 1956, he was arrested for possession of marijuana, but the charge didn't go anywhere. This unfortunately would not be the last time he would meet the police. He managed to land two more roles during 1957, also married a woman named Marilyn Jane Bush, who was his longtime girlfriend at the time in 1956, and during their marriage, had three kids. But in 1960, due to bad circumstances, the couple ended up separating and getting a divorce. From here, Bobby's life only got worse. He changed his name to Robert Driscoll to try and get away from the stigma of being a Disney star and with this managed to land two more screen roles. But later on, he was found under the law again. This time being charged with, to quote Wikipedia, disturbing the peace and assault with a deadly weapon. After hitting one of two hecklers with a pistol who had made insulting remarks while he was washing a girlfriend's car. These charges didn't end up going anywhere like last time, but that was the least of his problems. At this point in his life, Bobby's drug addiction was only getting worse, and in 1961, he was imprisoned at the Narcotic Rehabilitation Center of the California Institution for Men in Chino, California, where he was sentenced as a drug addict. Because of his now very tainted history of drug use and assault charges, when Driscoll finally left in 1962, he was unable to find acting work. No one wanted a man who had sunken so low. Keep in mind that this was around the 60s. They didn't treat mental health the same way we treat it now. 
If you were mentally ill back then, you were on your own. All of these events turned the once bright-eyed child star into a bitter, depressed, and angry man. He has been quoted as saying, I have found that memories are not very useful. I was carried on a silver platter, and then dumped into the garbage. Bobby then tried to relocate to New York City to try and revive his career in 1965, but like his original home in Los Angeles, he found no success. His life had a hopeful change, where in making friends with a poet and artist named Wallace Berman, he tried to make his mark in the world of art, with some of his works even going as far as to be exhibited in Los Angeles at the Santa Monica Museum of Art. However, that hopeful change grinded to a screeching halt. On the 30th of March, 1968, in a deserted East Village tenement at 371 East 10th Street, Bobby's dead body was found lying in a cough, surrounded by religious pamphlets and two empty beer bottles by two young boys. The cause of death? Heart failure caused by advanced atherosclerosis from his excessive drug use, dying at the age of just 31. With his body unclaimed, he was buried in, and I quote, an unmarked pauper's grave in New York City's Potter's Field on Hart Island. No one knew who he even was until months later, in 1969, when his mother tried to contact him due to his father nearing death's door, which led to a fingerprint match that confirmed who Bobby was. And despite his name being on his father's gravestone, his remains are still buried on Hart Island. The world only found out about his death in 1971, when reporters did some digging and found out what happened. Bobby was dead for almost three years before the world found out. A very depressing story, isn't it? Bobby's life was something that people thought could only ever happen in their wildest dreams, but yet it happened. Bobby, who was once a star, had his life tossed aside over something he couldn't control, leading him down a path of self-destruction, addiction, and misery. He died in the worst of conditions with no loved ones around him, and the world only found out about it a few years later. His life is a story that remains as one of Disney's foulest and cruelest examples of companies taking advantage of kids and their dreams only to drop them like a hat the moment that pesky puberty kicks in. It's a story that everyone should know, and one that in the context of this movie should have been handled with the respect it deserves. If this movie had any tact at all, it would have either not done this at all, or it could have shed light on one of Disney's darkest stories and could have made a very powerful and ballsy move of calling out their horrible behavior in the past and showing that they've gotten better. It would have been a way to honor Bobby's death by showing this Peter Pan as being a washed up actor that had his glory robbed from him and being cast aside for something that wasn't even his fault. This Peter Pan should have been a character that the audience sympathized with. He should have been the character that everyone remembers because of just how tragic his story truly is. That would have been what happened if the writer was willing to do any research to show that side of Disney. But you see, doing something like that would have made Disney actually have to expose itself. They actually would have had to shed light on a part of their history that makes them look disgusting and evil. It would have exposed them as being not the perfect little snowflakes that their brand has been trying to show off for over a hundred years. So, like the Chinese government responding to their war crimes, the movie does not address this. Instead, it doubles down and makes Peter Pan the main villain. This isn't a case of a sympathetic villain going evil because of the character going down a dark path due to bad circumstances. No, that, that actually would have been interesting. That would have been respectful. This Peter Pan is just a fucking man-child that is just jealous and bitter about what Disney did to him. And now he makes bootleg cartoons where he goes around trafficking various cartoon characters, disfigures them using surgeries and erasers, makes a porter potty line just so that the movie can wank itself off by making a fucking stupid pun, and sells stinky cheese on the side so that he can sell it to mouse characters. Peter Pan, in this movie, is a pathetic man-child drug lord that is to be laughed at. 
that is his whole character. He doesn't have any deep or personal vendetta against Chip and Dale, he simply just wants to make a stupid reboot out of them because they got in the way of his scheme. He's boiled down to what is basically, and I know the irony of my criticism when I say this, a cartoon villain. And with a story as dark as Bobby's being the baseline of his whole origin story, it is beyond tasteless. Now, some people have tried to defend this movie by saying that the similarities between these two stories are just a coincidence. And to an extent, they are right. According to a Polygon article that interviewed the creators of the movie, yeah, that Polygon, it reads, and I quote, Schaefer says the film's creative team didn't want to make fun of child actors, but that they were keying off the ways former young stars are sometimes unable to continue their acting careers as adults. He calls it one of the sad things that happens in Hollywood. So we were like, well, so what if it gets applied to a cartoon, he says. When the writers were considering child cartoon characters who might be appropriate for the storyline, Peter Pan was an obvious choice. Now this is an argument that could be made to defend this movie, but I am going to fight that defense by saying that I don't fucking buy it. Let me just play you some clips from the movie and let's compare and contrast to Bobby's story and try to find any similarities. Peter Pan is involved in a drug cartel. Hmm. Sounds familiar. You know, I always like money. It's a shame what happened. Too much cheese, not enough bread. Hmm. Sounds familiar. You know, I got my big break when I was just a kid. I got cast in the biggest movie in the world as the boy who wouldn't grow up, Peter Pan. Hmm. Sounds familiar. Then I got older, and they threw me away like I was nothing. Hmm. Sounds familiar. I was scared, desperate, and all alone. Hmm, sounds familiar. I get how you feel. Things didn't work out the way you wanted, right? You had big hopes and dreams and, well, then the world just sort of breaks your heart. Hmm, sounds familiar. And it feels like the only emotions you have left are anger and loneliness. Hmm, sounds familiar. You can't, you actually can't. You cannot be this fucking dense. So, no. I do not believe that this was just a coincidence. My opinion is that it is either at best a completely stupid and ignorant move on the writer's side, which is me being very fucking charitable, and at worst, a disgusting attempt to try and make Disney look good in a story where they were the cause of someone's death. Even if the first option was true, and the writers didn't want to make fun of child actors but instead wanted to shed light on child actors getting shafted when they reach adulthood, why was Peter Pan then made the villain? Bro, when you go out of your way to try and shed light on a dark aspect of Disney's history, you don't then go and villainize the victim. Do you not see how in doing that it completely contradicts your message? There is no defending this. Any way you look at this, it's incredibly insulting. Bro, that last documentary title, my god, I hope Disney burns to the fucking ground. Even if you were to take out all of this shady backstory out of the picture of the movie, you know, let, let's be charitable here. Having Peter Pan be the villain doesn't even make sense in the movie's own universe. For one, a whole plot point around Toons is that they don't age. Proof of this can be seen all throughout the movie, where characters from old shows don't look a day older than their first appearances in their debut shows slash movies, like Peter finding a lost boy in the con crowd who doesn't look like he aged at all. Which leads to me asking, why is it that only some Toons get older while others don't? What's the reason? What's the process behind that? I don't know, because that shit is never explained. Two, because this film is set in a universe where all of these movies the characters played and exist in our world, Peter's transformation from a child to an old man due to time doesn't make sense because in 2002, a sequel to Peter Pan was made called Peter Pan Return to Neverland, where you see Pan not looking a day older than he was in the original film. So, what happened? Why does this Peter Pan look so old? Why did he change so drastically? Oh, I know. It's probably due to the fact that the writers didn't know that this movie existed. Maybe you might have been able to acknowledge that if you guys just weren't focused on wondering how much you can get away with. And three, the biggest thing that is in this movie's plot is the idea of machines that can change people's appearances and art styles and full-on erasers that can rub out parts of a tune's body. So why didn't Peter use these? 
Did it never cross his mind that he could have just done the surgery and all would have been fine? The film could have even done something where Peter did all that but couldn't change his voice and that's why he wasn't able to find work anymore. That could have been a cool commentary on characters having voices that don't suit them, but no! Peter doesn't do any of that! He just does it on other people when his ticket on going back to his glory days is right in front of him. It's no wonder why this film's world building makes no fucking sense. The writers were just so determined on pushing the boundaries of what they could get away with that they didn't put any effort into making the story make any logical sense. Old Peter Pan shouldn't even be a concept. He breaks every established rule this world built up for itself and I'm expected to just accept it and laugh along while this villain villainizes a character who was a victim! Holy fuck! What makes all of this more infuriating to me was that it didn't need to be this way. Chip and Dale could have had a villain that not only would make more sense to them, but also actually be really funny. To the people who don't know what I'm talking about, around the time the movie was coming out, there was a leak on 4chan that went around discussing what actually happened in the movie. And according to the leak, it wasn't Peter Pan who was the villain, and the person dressed up as Pan in the trailers was actually a guy just named Mean Dean, but the main villain was actually... Pluto. The leak says that because of Chippendale always upstaging him in his own shorts and always being casted as a dog because he was a quadruped, Pluto, feeling humiliated and furious, tried to get revenge on the chipmunks by capturing Gadget to make her invent a new machine that would turn him into the ultimate tune, by copying various traits from other characters he kidnapped, both 2D and 3D. The funding for this project came from a video piracy operation he ran, and with all these traits, Pluto would transform himself into a walking copyright infringement. With a premise like that, could you imagine just how funny that shit would have been? Not only would it have not required the writers to take anything from real life in order to make it work, but it makes Chip and Dale themselves feel more important in their own movie because the villain is now someone they knew and might have even treated as a friend back in their heyday. It could have been something that honestly would have been really good in the right hands, but instead, we get Peter Pan, a character with a backstory that would have taken only a Google search to find out as the bad guy. Good god, this movie's fucking terrible. As for the animation of the film, I found this movie's abundance of animation styles to be far too jarring, and with the movie's animation budget only being about an eighth of an average Pixar movie, at least according to the wiki page, so take that as you will, lots of the animation was done via CG rather than the characters' respective styles. And while yes, I do understand that limitations on movies like this exist, and I know that Cutting Corners was the right call to make at the end of the day, if you're making a movie that is supposed to be a love letter to animation, Shouldn't you at least attempt to animate the characters in their respective styles? Because taking the easier route and doing nearly all of the animation via CGI just kind of makes the whole love letter to animation bit feel a bit... disingenuous? Like for example, the Cheese Chef and Captain Putty are both characters that are CG animated, replicating the art styles of claymation and puppetry. And while yes, it's very impressive that they managed to replicate the styles so well, to a point where I honestly thought that the puppet model was actually a puppet, couldn't they just hire people who work in those fields to animate these characters? I mean, wouldn't it have been cheaper to just hire a puppeteer, hell, fucking anybody, to do the puppetry of the character, rather than going the extra mile and making the puppet CG? That just feels like a lot of extra work for something that sounds fairly easy. Couldn't they have also done that for the claymation stuff? I mean, yeah, it'd be difficult in some scenes because Captain Putty does have to fight someone in real life, but come on, couldn't you have at least tried? It kind of shoots the whole, well, this movie had a low budget defense in the foot because if the budget was really that small, why would they waste so much on a character that's not even in the movie for 10 minutes? That budget could have been spent elsewhere, like making the 2D characters actually hand-drawn. Because making them all just 3D models with 2D skins just makes the characters look unnatural and even a bit unfinished. And while yes, I do understand that the movie was trying to replicate 2D animation's more rough and jagged style of movement, when I see two 3D models animating at different frame rates, for example in every scene involving Chip and Dale speaking to each other, the clash in animation styles makes the movie very hard to watch at times. I don't know, I just constantly had the feeling that the 2D characters weren't supposed to replicate 2D animation, 
but it was simply that they just weren't fully rendered. And before any of you tried to pull the budget excuse again, Roger Rabbit was able to accomplish all of its animation on a similar budget with lesser equipment nearly 40 fucking years ago. Don't believe me? According to online sources, Rescue Rangers' budget was approximately $70 million. Which yes, sounds like a lot. But Who Framed Roger Rabbit's budget was $30 million when it started in 1985, which if you calculate inflation, is about $75 million. These two films had roughly the same budget, yet the difference in quality is staggering. There's just no excuse that can be made here, the animation just wasn't handled properly. I do understand that a lot of that budget goes towards advertising and promoting the movie, which Rescue Rangers did a lot of to be frank, but it just goes to show that a budget can only really affect a movie's quality if it's handled incorrectly. They weren't prioritizing the animation when they really should have. When it came to Rescue Rangers, it feels like there were a few decisions made that ended up hurting the movie's quality in the long run. I don't believe the budget being small is a good excuse to justify the filmmakers not trying to go all in on their 2D animation. And when I see pieces of animation that are very clearly hand-drawn, like Roger Rabbit in the opening animated by one of the people who worked on the OG film, it just makes me all the more confused and disappointed that this film didn't try to do it all the way through. This movie was desperate to pay respects to 2D animation, by not respecting 2D animation itself. Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers was the first movie I watched in my entire life where after I saw it, I felt genuinely offended. This movie was one where every single minute I watched was more painful and soulless than the last. Everything from the lackluster characters, the excruciating self-awareness, and the absolutely distasteful way it tries to call itself out, I can say with 100% confidence that this film was one of, if not the worst movie I have seen so far. This movie really could have been something. It really could have been a film that if done right, would have captured the spirit of what made Who Framed Roger Rabbit so good all those years ago. It could have been something like that if Chip and Dale had even the slightest bit of heart behind its story. But rather than call themselves out and make a movie that could have been a genuinely great commentary of what it means to be part of the Disney Empire, Chip and Dale came out as being a movie that was cynical, self-aware, and completely lacking in any substance. This may not be a reboot of Rescue Rangers per se, but it definitely felt like a movie that has fucking killed them for many, many years to come. This movie was truly, truly awful. My name is Manga Writer, and self-aware humor needs to take a long break from mainstream media, because every time I see it being used, it's only showing the world that it is just a fucking disease. Please, for the love of God, stop being in on the joke. It's not funny.